Hello everybody. Today I want to talk to you about my Singleton 60 card brawl deck. This is a deck that I made specifically for casual games and uh, if you want to you can watch the previous video from the series where I talk about my mono blue deck with Arcanus the Omnipotent as the commander. Here we have got Palladium Morse as the commander. We'll talk about Palladium Morse a little bit later. Uh, so here we've got the three color deck, uh, which is definitely interesting in terms of the mana base. So I think I'm going to start with that. So first of all, we have got, of course, all foils, four of each basic lands. Here we have got this uh, beautiful John Avon forest. And uh, we also have got this marvelous Ice Age art arena foil reprint. And, um, of course, this is not enough, so basic lands, you cannot really expect some proper mana stabilization with that. And uh, for this we have got a ton of non-basic lands, starting with some rather simple solutions, such as those tap lands. Uh, they are a little bit weak in modern terms, by modern standards, because when they come into play, now you can get a tap land, even in the common rarity, not the uncommon rarity, which comes into play and gives you one life and uh, another, but I think it's in rare from uh, Ikoria, where you have got a land that comes into play tapped as well, but can give you three, not two colors. And I even think they have the basic land types, which is a kind of an advantage in most cases as well. Uh, so obviously, as you can see, there is no red and white tap land. This is because in uh, those days, it was very important to look at the color combination and see whether it is an allied color combination or an enemy color combination. So I'm sure that you've heard about it, but if we look at the pentagram, the allied colors will be adjacent. So for instance, for the white color, we have got green and blue as allies, and obviously the colors that do not touch it here on the pentagram would be red and black, which are its enemies. And um, it was very important to see whether it's a, an allied or an enemy color combination, because for allied colors you had all of the uh, nice uh, bonuses, you have got some synergy, and uh, of course you had more cards that benefit you if you play this combination. But playing the enemy colors was not that easy. Sometimes you wouldn't have cards for that, sometimes it would cost more, you would have some more serious drawbacks, and um, there is one more example of that. So these are the original pain lands from uh, Ice Age. Of course, the art is different here, but uh, these are from the green and white and uh, red and green color combinations, respectively, allies then. And uh, it was only in Apocalypse, which was actually focused on this theme of enemy colors, and uh, it was only then that we got the enemy color pain lands. So how do I feel about pain lands? I think there's a really nice compromise here because they can give you one colorless mana. You can tap it for some particular color of mana if you need to. So they're not going to be, you know, set aside like a city of brass would usually be uh, because God forbid you touches it. Uh, you know, God forbid that you touch it and... Uh, get damage from it late in the game. Uh, so yeah, these I really like. They were considered to be a staple at some point in time for some decks that ran several cards. So it's a nice, I would say, replacement for dual lands that were, of course, considered too powerful for standard later on. Next, another solution in terms of a compromise, also only in the allied colors, we have got the filter lands. So the filter lands from Odyssey, I never felt too good about them because they're highly specific. It's a kind of a niche card. So first of all, it's definitely not something you want to get in your hand early. And um, of course, it's uh, for one colorless and you can tap it, but only get this particular combination of mana. So of course, later on, uh, these were fixed in Shadow Moor. Yes, we had some better filter land solution, but here it had to be this specific color combination, which is not good if you want to get, uh, for example, double mana of the same color. 
But I still decided to play them, and I have to tell you that I managed to stabilize uh, early on in most of the games that I played with this deck. And uh, probably the secret is that we didn't have any kind of uh, land destruction, uh, which is itself, I would say, more uncommon than in old school magic. For all of you old school magic fans watching this, but um, it is what it is. So, City of Brass. Uh, Let's just appreciate the art. So, 7th edition art uh, was a hit and miss, of course. Sometimes there were some terrible decisions. And uh, I, just like most people, hated it when it came out. But now I see that there is some charm. And um, it really does fit this pre-modern art style, pre-modern theme. Of course, pre-modern is quite a big format in terms of its lifespan. And, of course, there are different, I would say, categories. Uh, but um, to me, it would still be called the so-called silver, silver era of magic, I believe. And uh, with that, we'll move to some more interesting lands even. So as you can see, here we have got... So this is probably my favorite. This is probably my favorite, one of the best lands here. And um, it's a reflecting pool. What it does is that it can give you one mana of a color that another of your lands can produce. So, for example, if you have this and City of Brass, then it is a City of Brass that doesn't deal you any damage. And uh, it can be, of course, just written on the card here, right? So, of course, if you tap it, you're not going to get one damage. Um, so, it's a really, really good card. So, since it's Singleton, we don't have to worry about this, but, of course, if you play some other format, maybe you should uh, think about it a little bit more, because if you have four of these, uh, there are some chances that you get two of these in your starting hand and then you can do nothing. So have to think about how to balance that. Uh, next, we've got some very interesting lands. Um, layer land, okay? So here they really, really tried to make sure that it's fair, tried not to break it. Uh, so, number one, it is a layer, which is itself a drawback, as you see here from this text. When it comes into play, you must sacrifice it unless you return a non-layer land, like this one or any other four color combinations of three colors from Plane Shift. And um, uh, basically, the idea is that uh, you will get uh, three different types of mana, but you will essentially skip your next land drop. So. Not really skip your land drop, but you got the idea. So you have to boomerang your own land. And if that land is another layer, then uh, that's pretty much game over because you have to sacrifice it. And if this land is a tap land, imagine how slow will it be, you know, how far you will be thrown back if you do this. So have to be very careful with this. Again, here, the most important fact that saves us is that it is a singleton format, so having one of these is usually more or less safe. And uh, here is just a really nice utility land, uh, comes into play tapped again, uh, and uh, we have got the judgment symbol set here. So in judgment, uh, in case you haven't heard of this, uh, we had this very strong white and green theme. So essentially it was the judgment, it was the, mm, so to say, way to uh, compensate for all of the injustice that was dealt in the Torment days, which was the black evil set. Uh, so, and also Wizards of the Coast later revealed that they felt that White and green combination needed some love. It was not very popular, I guess. It's too straightforward. It's uh, pretty basic. It's just too kind, maybe. I don't know what the real rationale here was, but I, I can see why they did that. So here for two and sacrificing it, you can search your library for a forest card and a plains card and put them into play tapped and they shuffle it. So, of course, it serves many purposes. Number one, you get card advantage, you get some acceleration, you uh, manage to stabilize in terms of the colors of your lands that you've got. 
And uh, of course, of course, it also thins out your deck and it does it even better than a fetch land would do. Of course, it's a little bit slow, but for this format, it's not too slow. It is justifiable, I can say. Next, we've got the three man lands. So this is the popular cycle of man lands. They were reprinted many times. I think Tree Top Village is actually the most popular of them. The second most popular would be Fairy Conclave, which you could see in my mono blue deck video. So I've got this uh, full set of them uh, and uh, all of them are foil. So it's a really nice thing. And uh, Tree Top Village is really good because it's for two mana. It gives you a 3-3 three, three green creature with trample and back then the 3-3 three, three creature with trample was quite fearsome, you know. So <coughs> this same thing cannot be said about Gitu Incumbent, the red one becomes a 2-1 red creature with first strike. 2-1 uh, first strike, it's not really relevant, is it? Because when you start to use it, uh, it's probably going to be your third turn, and most likely, if your opponent has some kind of a creature-based deck, uh, one power, one toughness, I mean, it's... I don't know. I really don't like this. I feel that this uh, first strike was just given to you uh, so that you feel that this is a red card, but I don't know. They could have done something more interesting. So pretty useless. And uh, this one is even worse because it's one five white creature, which counts as a land. I don't know. I don't feel like using this land for uh, blocking purposes, but it's not much. So, these were the lands. It was quite long, but uh, we managed to discuss different types of lands. Here, let's talk about the other cards. We have got Palladia Morse as the commander. So, Palladia Morse is, of course, from old school magic, not pre-modern, but it is the proper Elder Dragon. And um, if you saw my video on Elder Dragons, you can check it on my channel, where I rate them. I would probably say that Palladia Morse is the second best Elder Dragon, because Nicol Bolas is obviously the most epic of them. Uh, Nicol Bolas is just incredibly powerful, it's such a good ability. But uh, this one is very good in terms of combat, because look at this. Flying and Trample, 7-7. Seven, seven. So the same stats as uh, Lord of the Pit, only without this incredibly high upkeep cost, right? Sacrificing a creature, so... Finding 3 mana, if you manage to cast it from your hand for 8 mana, definitely not going to be a problem. So, what can be said about Palladia Moors? It's very important to have this double evasion, because flying later in the game, most likely your opponent will have some flying creatures, if uh, we've got some kind of a maybe creature stalemate, and uh, if you are going for the kill here, uh, it's very important, you know, every turn counts, of course. And you don't want your opponent blocking this guy with a Suntail Hawk or some other uh, minor chump blocker. Uh, so Trample and Flying really make sure that this card hits very, very, uh, in a very powerful way. Because look, it's it's bigger than Shivan Dragon, right? It's just incredibly big and good. So I like it a lot. Definitely worth waiting for it when you can cast it from your command zone. Next, <coughs> let's go to uh, different cards in no particular order. There will be creatures, there will be spells. And uh, here we have got <coughs> Sparkcaster. So, uh, as I said, here we're really trying to make use of uh, different multicolor cards. And um, since we have got a lot of different mana stabilization mechanisms, I just decided to go for it to try and make use of those uh, mechanics that they introduced in, in Invasion. I mean, of course, we had multicolored cards before Invasion, but if you remember some multicolored cards from old school, you will understand what I'm referring to. You know how bad many of them were. So with uh, the Invasion block, and uh, of course the Plane Shift uh, was the second set and the Apocalypse was the third set, Wizards understood that actually making your color, uh, making your card multicolored one is a kind of a drawback. So it's definitely more difficult to just include this card in your deck 
if it has two different colors and uh, you should be compensated for that in some way. That's why they started to add some kind of uh, benefits, some kinds of extra abilities. They started to make, for instance, creatures with a higher power and toughness if they were multicolored. And of course, if you've got three different colors, it's even better. So uh, there it is. Here we've got an interesting ability. So in um, Plane Shift, there was this idea. So probably Flame Tongue Kavu, which we will look at in a second as well, in a minute, maybe. Um, also an example of this one. So when it comes into play, it does something uh, rather powerful. And uh, also it uh, forces you to return a creature of one of these colors to the owner's hand. And um, on the one hand, it is a kind of a drawback, of course, but look, it's 5-3 for four mana, so that's already good. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, it will let you use this ability. It will let you uh, bounce these creatures and play them again to enable your ETB, meaning entering the battlefield effects. And uh, here it's really important because if you bounce this guy, um, and look, it, it can even be this creature, right? So you can, even though it's a little bit too expensive, for four mana, every turn, deal one damage to your opponent. Or maybe you can even do it twice per turn if you have got eight mana. So actually, it's a really, really interesting card. And again, 5-3 body, it's not that bad, uh, even with the drawback. Next, we've got this card okay um really really interesting enchantment and um if you combine it with something that is uh, preventing damage in some way then uh, it will be very difficult for your opponent to get rid uh, of of this creature to actually start dealing damage to you so this is a really game changer if you have got some sorry for the jump cut so Perea is I mean, Perai is a very powerful card, of course, as I have said. And uh, for example, you can put this on a card that has protection from something, maybe from colors, maybe it cannot be dealt any kind of damage. And of course, you can put it on your opponent's important creature. And uh, I remember that I played it in uh, my fun deck uh, with uh, Fitter Hydra, I think this was the name of the card, which gained as many counters as uh, much as the amount of damage was dealt to that. And uh, it grew very fast. It was uh, really, really impressive. So, yeah, it's a really nice card. And uh, in the worst case scenario, it will just save you uh, for a turn or maybe just will act as a removal magnet for some time. Next, uh, the Tusker. So the Tusker is one of those... Uh, uh, really nice pet cards that I liked. Uh, it maybe shines in limited. Uh, maybe it's not really important for constructed. But uh, what it does, as you can see, is that you may search for a basic land, reveal it, and put it into your hand and shuffle your library. Six, five, or seven mana, that's a bit too costly. But the cycling ability is nice here. So essentially for three mana, you draw a card and... Uh, put a basic land of your choice into your hand, uh, which is not that bad of a deal. So essentially, there are three different functions in this card. Next, we've got Swords to Plowshare, so this card doesn't need any introduction. It's just this uh, art that some people actually like. I'm not sure whether I do, because, well, it's uh, Swords to Doves, I guess, not really Plowshares, but... Yes, uh, I'm not entirely sold on this one. And also for uh, this artist, it's not a very typical lifestyle, lifestyle, art style, I mean. Uh, so, yeah, there it is. Anyway, of course, since I have the Ice Age art, I would like to play pre-modern art in a pre-modern deck. Urza's Rage. Urza's Rage was a very expensive card in terms of money when it came out. Um... The kicker here is insane, but this was in the days of uh, mono blue control, uh, some permission decks, draw go decks if you want to call them that way. Uh, th these decks were really prevalent and uh, <coughs> because of the really powerful and nice Mercadian masks alternative costs that we actually saw in my previous 
mono blue uh, pre-modern brawl deck. So here uh, you can either play it for three, then it's just three damage to target creature or player. So uh, kind of a disappointing lightning bolt. But if you did pay the kicker cost, which as you can see would be 12 mana, which is a lot, uh, you will deal 10 damage to a target creature or player, that damage cannot be prevented. And of course it can't be countered by spells or abilities, even if you played without the kicker. So can it be countered, can it be prevented. So just leave until you have 12 mana and then it's game over for your opponent. Really powerful card, I like this idea, I like this uh, kind of an ultimate burn spell. And uh, the art as well, so I know not all people are fans of <laughs> robots of some kind. Uh, that we saw in some sets like Invasion or Mirrodin specifically, but for me it's good. Then, uh, Sabertooth Nishoba. So there is another Nishoba, of course, and, um, you know, for some time I used to think that there was a cycle of these cards. So I thought that there is, uh, for example, green and white, 5-5, five, five, with Trample and Protection for Loot, Protection from Red. And then, technically, there could be a 5-5 five, five, Trample, Blue and Black protection from let's say the red and green i think but that's not the case of course so uh, nevertheless uh, five five for six mana trample and the protection from two colors definitely rather powerful and um i don't know uh, a bit goofy if you look at it a bit basic i don't know it somehow reminds me of some early 90s i don't know transformer style some kind of uh, a uh, mech anime? I don't know why. <laughs> Very strange emotions. Mm, then, so Flame Tongue Kavu. Flame Tongue Kavu is a card we discussed today. So, when it comes into play, it is 4 damage to target creature. 4 2. So, essentially, there isn't much of a drawback. Okay, so it's not 4 toughness as we could expect. I don't even think that you could expect 4 4 for a 3 colorless and 1 colored mana in uh, Uncommon and Plane Shift. But here is the thing that. 4 damage to target creature certainly kills most relevant creatures in this format um, when it is cast. So that's very important. And of course you could also bounce it. And uh, <coughs> there was this theme. You know, there was even a card that returned. It was some kind of a drake that could return target Kavu creatures into hand um, for a certain amount of mana. So yeah, this enter into battlefield effects really started to shine in this set. Here we have got Decent Chance. So, um, you know, it uh, it's actually the older art. It's a reprint, I think, from Ice Age. Could be, yes. But what's really interesting here is that it has some kind of a stamp over here, right? So I got it from a local store. And, um, you know, these stamps, um, the more time passes, the more the stamps begin to matter. I know that there are some fans of stamped cards. They collect them. Uh, usually it's uh, from some kind of a tournament. Of course, it's to prevent cheating. It's to make sure that uh, if you play, for example, a limited tournament, you do not use any other cards except for those that came from that tournament. And uh, yeah, sometimes when I get this um, and it was not specifically mentioned, in advance before you were sold this card I would maybe get a little bit sad but okay this was just some couple of cent couple of dozen cent um, didn't want to bother with that that much but yes now that we have these stamps I don't know they're somehow special in some way mm, uh, maybe you saw in my goblins deck uh, there was a stamp from the very first distributor of magic cards here in Russia and uh, this uh, store is not in business anymore. This was the very first LGS, the series of LGSs that opened. So for me now, it's even more value than a card with no stamp. Uh, so yeah, Spirit Link. Uh, not a fan of this art though. I don't know, this uh, kind of a uh, Simba biting this uh, fairy dragon. Mm, really weird. But, well, Spirit Link is Spirit Link. So... Definitely a card we should include. Incinerate. So Incinerate is, again, one of those attempts to make Lightning Bolt more fair when they realize that it's too good to have three mana 
uh, sorry, to have three damage for one mana uh, as instant. <clears throat> so three damage to target creature or player, no creature damage can be regenerated. So regeneration is not really relevant. Mm, is it relevant in uh, pre-modern? I don't think that it is. Not so many creatures with regeneration, but nevertheless, incinerate is nice. So here, as you will notice, we do not have a lightning bolt. So my rationale is, oh, I don't think that we do have it though. <laughs> we might have it, I'm not sure, but I don't think that we do. Uh, because my rationale is to separate, to try and separate uh, pre-modern and old school. Again, because old school is the most important format for me. And I don't really want to mix the art styles. I don't want to mix the card pools. So for me, they're just two different worlds and I enjoy them both. Uh, of course, with a higher emphasis on old school, but pre-modern, pre-modern, after all, is a uh, very nostalgic and nice format as well. So, Rorik's Bladewing um, was a star for some time, so came out quite late, as you can see, uh, 2002, so this is the penultimate year of old school, uh, of old school, of pre-modern, I mean. And it has Flying Haste 6-5 for 6 mana, super efficient, and uh, Flying and Haste, uh, very often can even be a guarantee of dealing this damage and I don't know what I really don't like about him is that he doesn't look like he's 6-5 okay he technically is more powerful than Shivan Dragon does it look more powerful than Shivan Dragon I don't know to me it's some kind of a drake maybe it's a 3-3 flying at most so yeah I don't know don't enjoy the art here Next, Armadillo Clock. Oh, so out of all enchantments that you put on your own creatures, so of course you understand that there's the inherent disadvantage that positive enchantments have. So when you play an enchantment on your own card, then it's enough for your opponent to just destroy your creature, remove it from the game or do something else to it or even play mass removal, and uh, then your enchantment will be gone as well. So uh, this uh, was definitely something that Wizards tried to fix later on, and uh, one of those ideas was to make you draw a card uh, in Ravnica, for example. Another idea, something that we saw in um, Urza's block, uh, this was that you had this aura, as we call them nowadays, that could be sacrificed, for two mana and drawing a card, uh, or it would be automatically bouncing to your hand when the creature or the permanent it is enchanting is destroyed. So there are many ways to do that. Uh, but here they went with something uh, pretty straightforward. It just gave them so many good things. So <laughs> it just shows that sometimes, sometimes to make a card good, all you need is just lower the mana cost because you know, in the past, so plus two, plus two, trample, spirit link, uh, would probably cost, um, you know, four mana, maybe five, probably not. But um, for three mana, it's definitely a good deal. Uh, and uh, let's not forget that they can stack. So if you have several armadillo cloaks, you know, it's a card that is loved by many. And um, of course, it shines here. It's a really good card. Uh, Jessica Warrior Adept, it's actually the sister of Kamal, uh, the pit fighter. We will discuss Kamal later, because he is also here, of course. So, first strike haste, 3-1, okay, maybe not that bad. Deals 1 damage to target creature or player. So, can ping for 1. No, not very impressed with it, but it is an okay card, let's say so. Oh, Chamana Revolutionary, from the Rebel deck. Prevent all damage that would be dealt to him. So this is the guy that I told you you should put Pere on. And uh, as soon as you do, that's it. So no damage can be dealt to you. Unless either he or um, that enchantment gets destroyed. So really good deal. Mercadius Mask. I don't know. To me, he always looked a little bit weak. Because, okay, he's a monk. But why is he too, too? Why is he revolutionary? I don't know. Can you... Um, be a real revolutionary with such a peaceful look. I don't know. But uh, I always like this card. I know that it's overcosted. I know it's irrelevant in many cases. But yeah. Mm, Desolation Giant. So uh, there were some cards in Apocalypse like that. So another example is um, the Angel. Desolation Angel, I think it is called. Uh, so you would have the Kicker in the enemy colors. And uh, when it comes into play, destroy all other creatures you control. So definitely don't want to do that, right? 
but if you did pay the kicker cost you will destroy all other creatures instead so this means that maybe after a board wipe or just being in a bad position uh, this guy comes and kills all other creatures so of course you should time it properly but it's a Wrath of God and a 3-3 body. So that's very, very impressive for six mana, but that's not too much. So I really enjoyed this card. Uh, it's really a game changer in many cases. And the same can be said of uh, Phantom Nishoba. So we saw the previous Nishoba. So Phantom creatures were a special breed. They were a, they were a series of creatures uh, ranging from common to rare in judgment and uh, they had the following mechanic so it's a zero zero base well which can be important right if we talk about counters but it comes into play with seven uh, plus one plus one counters in this case uh, here we have got the nice bonus of trample and uh, dealing damage uh, giving you life so the phantom ability is the following if damage would be dealt to it you prevent the damage and re remove a plus one plus one counter from it so essentially, uh, it is incredibly, incredibly mm, durable. Yes, it's um, something that survives very well. So at first, it's going to be 7-7, seven, 6-6, seven, 5-5. Six, six, five, five, and by then, it would have uh, dealt a lot of damage, gained you some life, maybe dealt damage to your opponent through trample as well. Um, so really good deal. And also, as you understand, it makes it incredibly difficult to uh, kill these creatures with burn spells so you cannot use burn spells because no matter how much damage you deal to it you will only remove one of the counters for each instance of damage dealing apologies for the jump cut again uh so anyway if you are watching this far into this video comment below something okay <laughs> saying that you are still here um, yeah, so Phantom Nishoba overall, it is a prime target for decks like um, Survival of the Fittest, uh, I mean the Oath decks, yeah, Oath of the Druid decks, because it doesn't have this anti-reanimation cheat protection, so to say, and uh, yeah, incredibly powerful, of course. Uh, obviously one of the later cards, so we already were transitioning into this uh, modern era of magic where creatures are incredibly powerful. So Kamal Pit Fighter, absolutely love this card. Also played it in Reanimator, had some goofy three color Reanimator, white, blue, and black uh, that I played uh, as a type two deck back in those days, you know, when uh, we had uh, Odyssey as the last set, I guess. Yeah, uh, and Torment as well, yeah. So six one, very fragile, okay. Uh, but does have haste and deals uh, lightning bolt damage to target creature or player. Super good. Love this card. Next, Shivan Worm. So again, from the series of cards that force you to return a green or red creature you control to its owner's hand. Again, it can be this guy that deals damage to other creatures. 7-7 uh, seven, seven, Trample for 5 mana. Incredibly good. Even with the drawback. Now, this... Uh, a glorious foil. By the way, it's a later foil. It's a time spiral. No, oh, time spiral. What a great nostalgic set it was, you know? And it was priced as a normal set. And you still got your rare, but you also got the time shifted card, which could be a foil. And oh, I can't even talk about it. So good it was. So yeah, the foiling here, as you see, is not really done in the same way as it was done in some uh, later example so for example if you look at the text box so here something which i really am not a fan of uh the text box is also foiled so here we see that i don't know it looks a little bit cheap and here we cannot see that so the text is isolated from the frame not the text box of course i'm sorry but you understand what i mean and uh, here it's it's a separate layer okay so these mana symbols do not belong here and uh, of course the mana symbols were different i'm not even talking about that so a lot of things were changed so nevertheless these cards are kind of a nice budget alternative especially if you want to get some cheaper foils because these foils are incredibly expensive and just hard to find it's not only about money but it's also about scarcity in many cases 
Uh, next, wing shards. Oh, I love this card. Um, it's kind of a controlish card. Target player sacrificing deck and creature storm. Storm is this mechanic that um, very often is said to be a very unfair, easy to break. Um, so it comes as a surprise. So imagine that you have got swords to plowshares and uh, this in your hand. That would mean that you will be able to um, remove three creature three creatures from your opponent and um, yeah it's just a very nice mechanic here uh, then we've got the charm so there is a cycle of charms in the plane shift and um, they all give you some decisions uh, choices opportunities and uh, here we've got three mana choose one destroy target non-basic land as instant that that's rather important uh, do you know many instant land destruction spells? Don't think so. Put three uh, Sprawling Creature tokens into play. Uh, not very impressive, but okay. Or prevent all damage a source of your choice would deal this turn. So, yes, my favorite charm is Dromer Charm, which is white, blue, and black, uh, which can do some powerful things like um, counter target spell, I think, de destroying something, gain your life. So... Yeah, this is, um, by the way, they are named after these dragons that we've got in uh, Invasion. So, for example, Crosses, the Purger, which is a nice card. We've got Crosses as Charm, so this is Writh. And, uh, of course, we have the Lair, right? Writh, Writh's Grove, okay? Also from this series. Next, one more card with this Bounce effect. So, you may play it anytime you could play an instant, which is important. And... Um, it's a 3-4 creature, so kind of a drawback, but what's good about it is that it can save your creature from removal uh, because it bounces it. It can also be a surprise chum blocker. It can be played uh, in a little bit more of a, I would say, tactical way at the end of your turn of uh, at the end of turn of your opponent, and then you can attack with it next turn. So a lot of things that can be done with that, and um, it's, it's a nice card. You can play it very tactically, I would say. And again, let's not forget about bouncing creatures and uh, making use of their comes into play effects. Um, so, uh, Silver's Rogue Elemental, again, um, the very last year of um, Magic before Modern Era, and um, we did get super powerful creatures without drawback. And of course, in what color is it better to get this powerful creature uh, than in green? Uh, eight, five, trample, regeneration, just for six mana. Super powerful. Volcanic Hammer. Volcanic Hammer is essentially the worst version of uh, Incinerate. And uh, it's still a playable card, not too good. Uh, do I like portal cards? You know, this is Portal Second Age, I think, right? The second of the three portal expansions. And I don't know. Um, at first, I didn't like them. Uh, at first, we, of course, didn't like them because they were not legal, right? Mo most of them were not legal in uh, constructed formats, you know. Uh, but then when they got into Legacy, they got more love, and uh, now many of them are quite sought after. They really are special, they are simple, uh, they have some special terminology, uh, which is a little bit um, simplified compared to uh, proper magic, so to say, but yeah, here it is. Then <coughs> we've got Two-Headed Dragon. This is a six mana, four, four. A bit disappointing. Uh, so this is, of course, a nod towards uh, Two-Headed Giant, but uh, except for this case, of, except for this uh, fact that it's completely different, because, as you understand, Two-Headed Giant can block two creatures, but this one can only be blocked by uh, two or more creatures, well, because it has two heads, and uh, each of them can burn you for four, at least. And uh, it can burn you for more if you pay one colorless, one red for plus two plus oh. So uh, you understand that um, essentially it's a kind of a 
worse version than fire breathing on the one hand but on the other hand for this deck that doesn't necessarily have a lot of red mana uh, it's probably even better the only drawback as you can see is that you cannot uh, do this with odd numbers for example i don't know your opponent is at 10 life uh, for example, at, at 9 life, let's say, for instance, and uh, you want to pump this guy for 5. You cannot pump him for 5. It can be either 4 or 6, and maybe it's that exact point of damage that you need to deal. Then we've got Noble Purpose. Noble Purpose, um, the really powerful enchantment. Of course, it's incredibly expensive. That's 5 mana. But when uh, a creature control deals combat damage, you gain that much life. So, of course, it's Spirit Link for everyone. And um, you understand how good it is. We've got a lot of powerful creatures. You can easily gain your 20 life back um, or more, of course. And uh, I remember I used to play it in a Shadow deck that I had. And uh, since Shadow is basically non-interactive uh, ability, so... They cannot be blocked, and they cannot block themselves, uh, obviously, they themselves cannot block. Uh, this this works very well, it works to your advantage, because uh, you will be able to attack your opponent, and they maybe attack you, but you will get your mana, I'm sorry, your life back uh, from Noble Purpose. Then we've got rocks. So what's special about rocks? Um, this is one of those foils that were absolutely everywhere. And uh, if you look at it, you know, at first you looked at it and you said, oh, it's a foil rare. So, you know, how common were rares back in the days of Nemesis? Not common at all. So very difficult to find foils. You know, now they are a dime a dozen. Many people don't even want foils, especially because they're like Pringles. But here, uh, as you can see, it says that collector number is 112A out of 143. And if you look at Nemesis, uh, actually, Rock's art is completely different. Here it's, uh, I don't know, some kind of a... What was his name? Bebop or Rocksteady? I forgot which of them from <laughs> Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles uh, was the uh, Rhino. But, um, yeah, he really looks like it. I like this illustration more than that uh, beast kind of rocks. Well, here it's also a beast, but at least it's anthropomorphic. So... <coughs> <laughs> the thing is that they were in some kind of a starter, and um, I don't remember actually where they came from, but because of that, this particular card is very easy to get, just like Thorn Elemental from the 7th edition. Yes, don't be fooled by this 7th edition foil. Uh, still too easy to find. So, nevertheless, uh, looking at the ability, it's really interesting. It's kind of a pseudo-trample. So here you have the choice of either damaging the creature or your opponent. In some cases, it's better than trample because you can allocate the damage to your opponent. But in some cases, you cannot properly distribute it between the annoying creature that your opponent has and uh, the opponent uh, themselves. So, regeneration is nice as well. Uh, so, overall, overall, uh, solid card, I would say. A Chromos Vengeance. So, of course, it's important to say that we have got these three colors for a particular reason. Each of the colors has a specific reason. We've got green for powerful, mighty creatures. We've got red for speed and uh, direct damage. And we've got white for uh, some kind of life gain, removal, and the idea of strength in numbers, some kind of pump spells. And, uh, of course, white is very good at removal, especially mass removal. It's probably the best color when it comes to mass removal. So here, you can destroy all artifacts, creatures, and enchantments. So for six mana, you get all-in-one Wrath of God for creatures, Shadow Storm for artifacts, and Tranquility for enchantments. Not a bad deal, right? For three mana, also, which is a bit more than usual. So, you know, in the past, cycling only used to cost two back in Urza's days, but later they started to experiment with it, which is nice, because it gives you some other interesting opportunities. So yeah, in case you don't need it, uh, you can cycle it as well. A really good card. Kabu Titan. Kabu Titan um, was this um, very fair kicker card, because usually when a card had kicker, if it gives you some kind of options, and the same is true for those charms, uh, the same is true for those split cards, there are many of these things. Uh, that give you more options. So the more options you have, the higher the cost should be. But here you essentially had no drawback because uh, the grizzly bear is fair, maybe not in rare, but okay. But if you kick it, then um, you get 
5-5 creature with trample. So essentially there is no drawback for using it either as a small or a big creature. And of course it shines in limited, but uh, I could also play it here. So here we have got this uh, sorcery, which is the Wrath of God. I really like this particular version. Uh, Wrath of God is of course iconic. And I really, really regret not buying one foil copy of the 7th edition Wrath of God locally. I was offered it about three years ago, I think, or two years ago. And uh, yeah, it just was a pity that I didn't buy it. I think it was for about 200 bucks, which was already expensive, but I did feel that there was some potential. So yeah, anyway, one of the sadder things. Uh, then we've got the Troll. And uh, the troll has vigilance, has regeneration. So again, getting back to this discussion that wizards understood that uh, multicolored is itself a kind of a drawback because if uh, you're forced to play a particular color combination with some extra lands, um, such as tap lands, pain lands, and so on, that's definitely something you should be rewarded for. And your reward here is that it is a, a vigilant creature with regeneration. Uh, not too powerful, but not too bad either. I don't know. I have very uh, fond memories of playing this card. Then we've got Explosive Vegetation. I bought a constructed deck. I bought about a dozen of constructed decks. And, you know, it's a bit of a shameful thing to say. Because I already knew that they were quite bad and a little bit overpriced. But, yes, my very first deck was the Mercadian Max Scrabbles deck. I also bought the Tombstone deck from Urza Saga, which I regretted. It was a terrible deck. And the last one I bought, I think, was in uh, Kamigawa Days. Uh, Saviors of Kamigawa, I think, was the last set back then. And I bought this deck uh, of Samurai. So, Samurai were actually rather nice. I mean, you can't go wrong with the proper aggro deck, so, for example, a mono white, it's always a nice choice, you know, because you don't need uh, any kind of uh, expensive enchantment, some powerful spells, it's just uh, pure meat, pure aggression, and uh, these swarm decks usually work nicely. So, uh, nevertheless, here I bought a beast deck, red and green, and that's actually interesting because I wanted to buy a cleric deck with Edge Walker, so white and black deck from Onslaught, but then uh, the seller convinced me, which I also think is kind of shameful because normally you shouldn't listen to salespeople when they try to push something to you, and of course I knew better uh, later on when I, uh, you know, come somewhere and uh, somebody tries to sell me something, I know that this is definitely not something I should be buying, most likely. Um, but yeah, nevertheless, I did buy this deck. It had explosive vegetation. It had this either flash, I think, was the name of the card, and um, or as a charge. Yeah, I think it was as a charge. So uh, for five mana, you had this enchantment that dealt, uh, I think, four damage to your opponent when a beast came into play. So, yeah, quite shameful to remember. But here, yes, um, two basic lands, put them into play tapped, four mana, uh, not a bad deal. Very good for mana acceleration. So you get this out turn four. Uh, next turn, you have six lands, which is impressive, and you can play one more. Mirror's Wake is the epitome of a powerful enchantment. Again, a judgment, retribution for having the... <laughs> uh, evil set of torment uh retribution of the forces of good he basically represented by white and green so here it says get plus one plus one whenever you tap a land for mana add one mana of this type so uh on the one hand you have got um uh, sarah's anthem okay not bad already and uh also you have got mana flare which works only for you incredibly powerful and the last card today is blaze and i just want to say that blaze is uh, my favorite depiction of fire on a magic card i know it's just a weaker version of uh, fireball uh, or disintegrate probably because wizards decided that we shouldn't have too many um burn for x spells and uh, at least they should be nerfed in some way or maybe because they really didn't try to enforce uh, the theme of hmm, fireball because yeah, fireball uh, 
math is really complicated, right? Uh, so there it is. And uh, there is a little story associated with this card. So I told you how much I like it. We've got all of the shades here, proper lighting, and uh, it's just a really, really beautiful depiction of fire. And um, there is this Facebook group, uh, it's called MTG Art Market, where you have got auctions for the original magic paintings, in case you don't know about it. So you should definitely ch check it out if you're a fan of magic art, because there are sometimes uh, some paintings, some high definition scans, or some people just want to post pictures of the original magic card that they have, either new or something or more vintage. And uh, you can even buy this art, but as you can imagine, uh, an auction for uh, something that is unique, so, and also, of course, highly sought after, right? Because every piece of magic card is highly sought after nowadays. Some people see it as an investment as well. And um, the thing is that uh, I really wanted to buy this uh, piece of magic art and I remember that I had a bid of uh, 3,000 and then it went higher, then it probably went to f around 5,000 and I was still in the game, but uh, there wasn't too much demand for this, which I don't know, for me it's surprising, maybe I'm being subjective when I'm saying this, it's an absolutely amazing piece of art. But um, I almost won it, but then I got outbid and uh, I couldn't, couldn't get this particular art unfortunately uh, so this was the only time I really participated in the auction and I had um, really really uh, I would say high level of determination to get this card but no still was outbid but I wonder just how much would a person the person who won this card uh, I mean the, this piece of art how much would they be willing to pay because um, Again, it's not the same as buying, for example, a dual land of eBay, right? Because there are hundreds of these, even in Alpha, for instance. But when it comes to something that is unique, it's really about your purchasing power and uh, your willingness to part with your money. So, yeah, now I really don't have any hopes of uh, getting a real piece of magic art. But who knows, maybe one day... Um, Nevertheless, it's definitely something that um, I enjoy in terms of art. So there it is. There it is. Incredibly long video. Uh, but again, thank you if you managed to watch until the very end. And um, I will definitely revisit pre-modern. Uh, but I will also be back with some old school videos, obviously. So stay tuned for more and bye.